about being Africans in this contemporary moment. I want to start by mentioning a, um, an article that is written by Sarah Ahmed. And if you Google her, she's a really an amazing uh, radical feminist, works mainly with language. And since our topic is about writing and we use language to write, um, she has a piece which I've been sharing with some colleagues, um, which is about willful women, stubborn women, women who insist on saying, um, I'm sorry for you who are this way, I, I'm tending to look this way. Uh, women who insist on saying what they think and what they know and what they want to be heard. So uh, what I did was I brought that energy to the topic. First of all, um, I changed the title. And uh, I will be speaking about writing as and for resistance because I don't like the notion of the role the role is a very passive term. It's fitted into structures and practices and traditions. And basically, it's very gendered. It implies conformity. And it applies mainly to women. So you see, I'm making people happy already. <laughs> so I changed it. I changed it. And I'm hoping that the laughter is a way of opening your mind rather than of resisting, because resistance is very costly. Yeah. If you resist, you lose. Yes. It's like snoozing, you see. So I changed it, because the language that we use, the words that we use, enable us to either say what we want to say, move our societies forward, transform them, rattle them, rupture, or stay in a cave in the past, thinking that we are safe if we are passive. Then I heard, I want to do two things quickly also. I heard somebody say, actually it was the last speaker, who was referring to Africa as her. Um, Africa is not a her, it's not a gender. Africa is a space. And it, space is it. It's not gendered in terms of the bi biology of a her or a him, OK? So we need to unlearn the feminization of land spaces because, because that feminization uh, reproduces and reiterates certain binaries, you see? that women are similar to culture, are similar to land, okay? And then, therefore, women's bodies become available for occupation, for breeding, for colonization, for penetration. You see? So, boo <laughs> So, we have to be very careful as writers. Because we are writing a script even when we use our mouths and our voices. It's not only the text. Script, as I'm going to read, script has many forms. And the spoken word is a script. So, Africa is an it, a land space inhabited by people of various genders. We know that there's more than just the two even though many of us are denying it. And thirdly, there was a, a sister who was speaking earlier on who said that Africa is the youngest continent. We must hear everything that is said. Africa is not the youngest continent. Africa is the oldest continent with a large youth demographic. Be careful of being relegated into the moment without a past. You see, we have to be very careful. We are the oldest place that humans have inhabited. We are the place where the humans took their first step. We stood up on two, and we took the first step forward. 
Nothing was more momentous in the human narrative, in the more human history than that. So we mustn't deny ourselves the credentials. Now I'm going to read. Because you know I love to speak like most of us who profess. So I'm going to speak as quickly as possible for the next 10 or 12 minutes. And um, I'm hoping that we can have some interaction around the issues that I'm going to raise. And I'm going to speak to two issues. Basically, writing is such a tremendously wide and large and adventurous topic. So I've tried to clip my wings and just focused on two or three key elements. When we consider the act and the process and the process of writing, we also understand that script is one of the earliest expressions of human movement towards the future as a foundational stepping stone into the discourse around writing and being in writing. Being in writing. The occupancy by humans of writing, of script. Okay, when I say I'm a writer, I'm saying that I'm, I'm located, I occupy writing through my being. This feature of what we call writing has remained central to the meanings, uses, and challenges that writing and being a writer means and has become. Because script and text are so powerful in terms of human progress as a tool of communication, of political expression, is it okay? Okay. Uh, of political expression and transformation, writing and being a writer, one who speaks about society, either to maintain the status quo or who speaks as a revolutionary. The script has always been deeply contested and remains a dangerous practice for Africans who bring the notion and practice of thought leadership to writing. I want to speak very briefly to these two features of writing as a process and writing as being, as a revolutionary choice and practice. As I've already intimated, writing is central to the designation of societies as social formations that have withstood the vagaries of history. Only those societies that were able to grow and expand socially and economically, that were able to manage the political tensions and ruptures related to internal and external factors in ethical ways, only those societies that did this that were able to create inclusive systems and practices which generated social cohesion. Only those societies have scripts that speak to these historical narratives of social survival. The evidence of survival takes various forms. Rock art, now we've all heard about it, right? And now it's Naledi. Rock art, and I have a problem with this popular expression of rock art because it does not immediately acknowledge rock art as script. And it feeds into this lie that Africans never wrote anything. So we have rock art, I'll use that for want of a better word, but if somebody else here has thought it through and can offer an alternative expression, I'd love that. Stone tablets. Books in papyrus, invented in Africa, although this is often erased by the claim that Africans did not have either an alphabet or written texts, or because Egypt is treated as though it is not in Africa. Then we have scripts on artifacts like vases, etc. And of course, we have the tomes. The tomes that have been rediscovered and retrieved that have been rescued from obscurity in the basements, mainly of Western museums. If you go to the British Museum, you only see a fraction of what the Brits plundered in terms of the cultural, written, textual heritage of Africa. Most of it is in boxes in the basement of the British Museum. And of course, also in, what's that big one in, in Washington, D.C.? 
the, uh, what is it that, that issues the, um, the ISBN numbers for books? What is it called? Excuse me, the Library of Congress, yes. So, um, however, on the African continent, many of these scripts that memorialized and documented this journey of social progress were either destroyed at the moment of colonial encounter, taken away, as I have already said, to be hidden in museums and archives that are located in the societies of the West and the East. Africa's historical script of human progress in these countries lies behind glass boxes guarded by state-of-the-art security systems. And despite many decades of polite negotiation for, re for the return of these scripts, most remain as highly valued items of so-called human heritage, which supposedly cannot be cared for or valued by Africans. This claim that only Westerners can preserve what is now called the human heritage through UNESCO is directly linked with the perpetuation of a lie that Africans were left out of history as, as in the construction of the canon of knowledge. The work of retrieving this heritage as uniquely African and belonging to Africa is a crucial contribution to debunking the myth that we do not and did not write. The Greeks have been more successful in retrieving their archeological scripts and artifacts Maybe because they have become more European in more recent times. Even though the contestation of over who is really European remains the quintessential barb in the core of European identity to the present time. I mean, look at the arguments that the Germans are making about the Greeks <laughs> and their irresponsibility. And then think about who is the authentic European. Hello, Hitler. All right? Therefore, while we have been able to retrieve and retain some of the critical texts that denounce a colonial lie that Africans did not have any historical or textual archive worth considering, most Africans still do not know of the history of the text as an African marker in our long history. One such treasure is the Timbuktu manuscripts. And here, we must thank the patron again for his prescience and courage on insisting upon the recognition and preservation of such scripts. More recently, the manuscripts have been threatened by a new form of colonization, the rising scourge of Islamic fundamentalism, which aims to erase any history that contradicts their totalitarian script of Arab supremacy. So this is the second round in the uh, erasure or attempts at erasure of Africa's uh, knowledge, the history of our knowledges. We have to become more engaged in the protection of the Timbuktu manuscripts and the knowledge they encompass, mainly because their significance is a central tenet of the African Renaissance. They are essential to our becoming Africans in new and contemporary ways that are organically linked to our pasts as Africans who carry many identities and knowledge, uh, and knowledge experiences. This must become a key activity of Tamale leadership. We must speak with our colleagues, our peers, our children, communities, about the fact that Africans had developed alphabets in various parts of the continent. We must search for the information and evidence and make this knowledge an important part of our conversations at family gatherings and at various social opportunities to reiterate what an earlier speaker passionately called for. Therefore, it becomes clear to us once we understand the significance of script, textual and social, in the African journey to where we are, that we have been writing and communicating through text for as long as human memory exists. It becomes clear that this evidence became a threat to the myths and practices of racial and gendered supremacy, and we realized that the text was and remains central to struggles for liberation and transformation in all our African societies beyond the continent, to every corner of the planet where we live, work, and struggle for dignity as Africans. And then we, you know, you can hear it in the calling uh, to Dubois, Dubois to, um, uh, who is the man who, the, who wrote the, the Jacobins? 
CLR James, and all the women that we call, of course. I'm not going to do that. People say to me, but you always talk about the absence of women and then you don't name them. It's not my job. It's our responsibility. So I deliberately leave that. I know many, many women who write, who are revolutionaries, but I'm not going to do the job for you. You know, find them. You can always ask me, of course, I might share a few. So this leads me to the next point of my discussion. Writing as being and some of the ways in which becoming a writer and living the being of writing is both a challenge and a gift that we bequeath ourselves as Africans as Tamilites. I could not possibly speak to being a writer without focusing on the exclusions that accompany writing and being a writer. Exclusions that express one's relationship with the state. If one writes in support of the state and the status quo, one is embraced and celebrated by those who occupy the state as a site of power and wealth and those who enjoy privilege from a particular type of society. But if one writes against the status quo, against patriarchal privilege and plunder, class plunder, against the exploitation and suppression of women in the domestic and public arenas, if you write against the misappropriation of public resources for the expansion of military systems and repressive infrastructures of the state, which are used to violate and subordinate the working people in the main, if one writes as resistance to unequal and exploitative systems and practices, one becomes vilified and excluded. Such a writer who names herself feminist and radical as an African woman, as a human being who occupies the African identity in new and contemporary ways, such a writer becomes a freak, a strange woman who is willful, indecent, westernized, man-hating, and eventually un-African. We often think of Europeans as othering us, or as males othering women, able-bodied humans othering physically challenged humans. But some Africans are othering radical Africans. So the othering process is not the monopoly of only certain groups that are privileged, either by racial privileging or by gendered privileging, but also the essentialization of the notion of who an African is in conservative, sort of cave mentality terms, yeah? Just tied to the past, always looking back and stumbling into the future because your eyes are always focused, focused on the past in ways that keep you back, you know? So then those kinds of um, uh, positions about who an African is tend to other radical Africans. The notion and reality of contemporary Africa, marked by the longest scripted memory we have of African resistance to colonialism and slaving, this, this reality is replete with texts written by Africans as resistance and for resistance. And most of these known texts are written by males. Of course, there is Michelle Mugo, there's Miriam Tladi, there's Ama Ata Edu, there's Nawal El Sadawi, there's Chimamanda Ngozi, and many more. Nonetheless, male writers are projected into the future of Africa as the knowers. Just look at the covers of the Thinker magazine. I mean, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> where do these people come from? Well, we know where they come from. Okay, so males are positioned as the quintessential expression of who the African is, what Africa means, what it will become. Women generally, and women who write in particular, are largely relegated to the margins of textuality and narration and knowledge creation and knowledge retrieval. This is a known fact, even if most Africans, women and men, would like to pretend that this is a fabrication by a radical woman. But, you know, I don't have to fabricate. I mean, really, it's all there. The dis-ease that this critique causes in an audience is often suppressed through denial, through a sense of annoyance, a dismissal through a laugh, a smirk, by waiting until the speech is over and one can release their sense of indignation. 
in various ways, body language, that tells you that people are uneasy. Yes, but dis-ease is a good sign. It shows you that something is happening, you know, it's changing. It's the first step towards liberating yourself. And a colonialism, those of us who, you remember that, that image of Winnie Mandela putting her face, a, a finger in the face of a white policeman. Have you ever seen that? You should Google it. Let me tell you, it's one of the most incredibly beautiful images of an African woman. And she's got her finger in this Kaburu's face, okay? And it was so powerful for me as a black, young black woman growing up, knowing that you know, something needed to be changed. And uh, well, of course, I, I soon found my way uh, into the change. So when Ngugi Wationg began writing in his indigenous language, Kikuyu, he was vilified by certain male African writers because he was reminding them of the hegemony of colonial languages like French and English. He was making those who define and own the canon in literature uneasy through his nativism. But he was also embraced by those Africans who had the courage to unlearn self-hatred and to transform their identities as writers who use writing as resistance for transformation of the self and for their societies. However, in spite of his revolutionary stance in terms of the use of indigenous language, as a revolutionary experience of writing as resistance, Ngugi continued to use the male protagonist as the knower and voice of being African, and to represent women in his novels in conventional and basically conservative ways. He remained patriarchally male in his African identity as a writer, and this partiality in his identity as a contemporary African writer has meant that his work remains incomplete and exclusionary. It is rare to read the work of a male African writer which centers and celebrates women as more than mothers, wives, daughters, concubines, and prostitutes. All the stereotypes that populate popular media in general. Writing uses script as speech with language as the voice through which ideas and knowledge is stated and transmitted. The language we use can either keep us in the cave stuck in the past, unable to move with time into new and changed personal and political social spaces, or language can be the key, the key part of our experiences of freedom. When we use language as a fossil, as a sacred cow that enables us to remain safe as Africans vis-a-vis -vis others, as women vis-a-vis -vis males, for example, then we are bound we are bound to remain in those sites of power and oppression that constrain and incarcerate us. And we are bound to come up against new ideas and lifestyles as confrontation and with fear. And I use the notion of being bound as a double entente. Bound and bound. Okay? If we treat language as a refuge from the imperative of changing the discursive spaces within which we speak, think, and imagine ourselves, we will continue to use the male pronoun as the norm, an unchallengeable given. It is a norm that conflates women, queers, people in general, ability-challenged individuals and communities. You know, those heterogeneous communities that make up the diversity of this continent and of the world, it conflates them and insists that we are all patriarchal men. This practice is called androcentricity, the centering of males in everything. Examples of this conflation are, for example, in the use of he for everybody, mankind, chairman, Images of males in the African passport about an African future. I mean, Africa as heteronormative, i.e. homosexuality and queer orientation is un-African. And then, of course, making male privilege culture and untouchable. 
From the earliest memory I have of reading and writing, I know I'm just a little over the time, but please, you know, um, what is the word? Humor me. From the earliest memory I have of reading and writing, I was reading and writing around the age of four. I realized the power of saying what I thought about being a girl and later a woman, overcoming the fear of being chastised and excluded for having different views and opinions about my life and about the society, of recognizing that writing is voice and that there is power and a sense of freedom that comes from particular words and from saying them through speech and text. Naming myself radical and feminist brings a particular power to my identity and existence as a woman and as an African. Writing as resistance is writing against patriarchal claims that women do not know anything. They only say, What does a woman know? And anyway, what, what are you speaking? Or oh, don't speak to me like that in that tone. Women have tone. Men can say whatever they want, however they want. But uh, if you just emphasize the power of your voice and the idea, they start saying, you can't speak to me like that. Eh? Am I touching a note there? Eh, I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> okay. Writing as resistance is writing against patriarchal claims that women do not know anything that we exist to serve men, to accept sexual and domestic impurity as culture and as African normality. Writing and speaking against normativity requires that I insist upon my individuality and my peculiarities as a female, woman, intellectual, writer, activist, vegan, radical African. I would have loved to speak for a while about the commodification of African intellectual uh, property. But you know, this is an, a an area that we need to talk, to speak to as Tamalites, because we are producing thought leadership, we're producing new ideas, we're recrafting the discursive terrains on which we are imagining ourselves as contemporary Africans. And we have to ask ourselves, do we want to use the old commodified systems and mechanism of publishing, of dissemination, or do we want to create an alternative African commons? for our intellectual uh, property. So the Constitution could deal with that. Um, so we see that while writing is key, is a key element in our contemporarity as Africans who have been writing as resistance to colonialism and neocolonialism, neoliberalism, and continuing forms of hegemony, various forms of hegemony, unless we can reconceptualize the meaning and practices of writing as resistance for full inclusiveness, in every sense of the word, we will be traveling a partial journey that will not take us to the desired destination of living in an Africa that is dignified and free. And let me stop there because I've gone way past my share. <laughs>